Stanley and Golf Cars, T.G. Brooks Company, and Owl Pride Foods, makers of Owl Pride Premium Pimento Cheese Spread and Dip. Good stuff. We're glad to have the crop agent on the program with us today for Person in Granville Counties, Mr. Gary Cross. Good well, morning. I appreciate that. I thought you was going to say crop agent extraordinaire, but we didn't get that out today. What's well, going have, on? But I can't pronounce that word. <laughs> I, I could say the uh, crop agent guru. Um, that, that'll work. Every time I have been in Person County, I've went by your place, you've got something going on. What is going Are you just trying to keep up with the grass or you, the horses? What's, what I'm are you doing you, out there? The grass is growing really good yeah. with all the rainfall. But now we got some grass growing really good that, uh, we have not been able to mow hay. I know with some people uh, have alone. a little bit of uh, opportunity uh, first part of May uh, to, to do get some. some hay cut. <laughs> but, but three weeks we haven't had. Yeah, it's been, been extremely wet, and they're calling for a little chance of rain uh, tonight, a chance tomorrow. But uh, it looks like uh, next week uh, the temperature is going to moderate a little bit, and uh, it's not going to be quite as humid. Oh, uh, please, I'm, I'm thrilled. Hopefully uh, it'll be the opportunity for a lot of the farmers that's been in muddy fields can uh, continue on with that work in progress. I know uh, on the way uh, into the station, Today, um, I noticed a tobacco grower trying to uh, start, you know, yeah. was planting oh, tobacco. Yeah. And I know typically a lot of farmers in this area, they start transplanting, you know, tobacco typically about the last week in April. Here it is, June 1st. And, it's tough. You know, and I've talked to a lot of farmers, and they say early on in the year, you're, you know, you're battling the weather, and then in the fall time of the year, you're like game busters trying to get your crop in the house before frost gets here, and so... This, this is a dilemma we're dealing with, Rob. Um, we've got a lot of tobacco planted. Uh, people cannot get... It's leached. The nitrogen, most of it, has leached out, and what we mean by leach is it's left the soil so because of all the rain, and plus... Um, on top of that, with all the rain, tobacco develops what you call shallow roots. And uh, those roots couldn't go down to get that, keep up with that nitrogen that was leaching out. So what we have now is a double, kind of a double whammy. We have farmers are going to have to at least put 10 units on immediately. And when uh, you say 10 units, of 10 nitrogen. units of nitrogen right. per acre. Uh, per acre. And the the other issue is related to... Uh, with all this wet weather uh, and shallow roots, they're going to have to irrigate quicker this year. Uh, as soon as it gets really hot and dry, it'll start stressing, starting to turn yellow. So they'll be irrigating quicker, and they'll be playing probably nitrogen now and probably another at what we call lay-by. And, uh, you know, because there's a lot of yellow uh, tobacco out here already, it should be kind of a green or even a dark green. And the thing we have to be careful about, and you were exactly correct, was uh, if we have an early fall and we put all this nitrogen on, it stays green, we could have damage from frost yeah. because of not turning. But our biggest concern after it not irrigating, after it, the rains, is shallow roots and having to get in and irrigate and putting nitrogen on. Um, I have two plots. I have a about a 20 entry corn plot, huge plot, that we planted in, I want to say early May, first week in May, and we have not been able to get in to do anything since then. So I've got corn as yellow as yellow roses, and it's, um, I, I don't want to say it's a total loss, but it's probably a 60% loss, even if we go in and put nitrogen I'm still going to be struggling to get that green back in it because there's so much loss of nitrogen and nutrients. A lot, so a lot of the plants will probably die. But, um, you know, I had a uh, soybean emergence plot where I'm measuring the emergence of the soybeans day one versus day four. Right. I did the day one 
and I have never been out be able to get back in the field to do the day four because you sink up to your knees. Right. Well, you know, Gary, I guess maybe well the first time you was ever on the show you came out with Carl Cantalupe, and but I remember a show uh, that that we had done and you had talked about a few things that I found quite surprising in in a corn crop and basically what you said was when corn is planted uh, that corn that sprouts you know all the all the corn seed that sprout earliest right and then you call that day one sprout, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then, if you keep up with the seed that sprout, the the second day after the first seed, you know, sprout. Mm -hmm. And then, if you keep up with the seed that sprout the third day, uh, now this is all in, in, in the same field, same row, and everything. I was really surprised at the broad spectrum of difference as it is from the corn that sprouts you know I'm gonna say the first day versus day number three and I know you have said that depending on how that kernel of corn is in the ground right it can use a lot of energy mm -hmm. you know breaking through the you know crusty part of the soil right and you're saying that with the technology of planters, as everything right. is going, that you're thinking that sometimes in the future it's going to be to where that corn uh, kernel will be placed in the proper position. position with the, with fertilizer right next to it. And in, 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 in the proper depth in the ground to make the sprouting so much easier. That is correct. These these guys who win these national yield contests, uh, 350, of course, they put a lot of fertilizer and everything on uh, to win these contests. But one of the main things that all of them look at is emergence. Because with my study I've done in this region for going on the fourth year now, is I've seen a 50 to 60 bushel difference in day one versus day four, or day three even. Uh, a lot of times a day three plant doesn't even have an ear on it or has an ear, what we call nubbins, wow. um, that, uh, you know, are short and they're round and don't, and don't have hardly any kernels on them. And uh, the issue is everything after day one is really technically a competitor like a weed. And uh, it's kind of like I have three older brothers and we all go to the same table to eat uh, chicken or steak. The three older brothers of me uh, are going to get theirs first. That's right. And then I'm going to get mine last. Yeah. So where am I going to be on the nutrient train That's right. That's right. Uh, when they're out there uh, doing that? Um, somewhere down the road, uh, I think the technology will get there. I, th I, I think we spend too much time, and there's nothing wrong with that, looking at what am I going to get on the, on the far end of the yield when we need to be looking at what am I losing on the front end of the yield to be able to to have a better crop you know if you grow 200 bushel corn and you're losing 60 bushel up front you should be growing 260 bushel corn That's not right. 200 bushel corn and, so, and and when you look at it that way if you're losing 50 to 60 bushels per acre uh that 50 or 60 bushel is your profit that's <laughs> exactly right you know? and uh it's just seeing i'll give ron heinegger credit there's some people at iowa state ron heinegger is a, uh, a corn grain specialist with our organization nc state he's done that study he's continuing to do it with uh, start starter fertilizer uh and there's guys out of iowa that's done it illinois state has done some of that work and i think a group out of oklahoma's done that oklahoma state and it's been looked at, but it doesn't seem like it's got the attention of what we do on the back end uh, of yield. You know, fertility, uh, you know, spraying fungicides, and that all helps. It gives you five or six more bushel, but what about the things that can give you 50 more bushel? Well, and you know, Gary, I, I think it kind of needs to be looked at in, in, in the same scenario. When you build a house, you want to build it on a good foundation. That's exactly right. And emergence is your foundation. I mean, you got to got to get that 
you know, plant sprout it and get it growing. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, as, as you mentioned, the weather <clears throat> depleting the nutrients out of the soil. And, and I've noticed, you know, in my travels where I've came across uh, some field corn and, and some tobacco that has drowned it out due to the excess rain that we have had. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, I know it's uh, the 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 the, blank, the rain is a big blessing, but also uh, it, it it can make it really tough for well, everyone well, trying you, to tend to their crops. Didn't you tell me when I first come here that yeah, it can rain here, but it can also turn off and be dry for the rest of the year? That's right. That's right. And I mean, you know, you've seen it. That's absolutely. You know. Uh, here we are, you know, in 30 days we'll be in July, and then 30 or so days after that we'll be in August, and and, and it could turn off to be, you know, bone dry. And um, You know as well as I do, and as we have talked about it with Johnny Coley, when, you know, corn and vegetables and things are really in need of, of, of water is when they are starting to form and grow that fruit. That's right. And something that, that you know, we will make mention of, uh, for those of you that uh, have done your soil samples and planted your garden and, and uh, added the recommended amount of fertilizer and or lime to, to your garden, uh, with all the rain and everything, a lot of the nitrogen could be depleted from the soil. You bet. And it probably wouldn't be a bad idea for you to add a little bit more nitrogen to it. And I don't think with the rainfall that we've had that you would really have to worry about putting too much to burn it up. But you don't want to overdo it because, as Gary said, you know, it could turn off dry and, and be a... Be a a, a real dry latter part of the spring and on into the summer. Right. I hope it doesn't turn out that way, but you, you just never know. Hey, we're going to, to uh, get a word on for Our Pride Foods, makers of Our Pride Premium Pimento Cheese Spread and Good dip. stuff. Good it's stuff. It really is. Whether it's a, for a meal or a snack, you can't go wrong. But as we go to break, I want to make mention that today, Friday, June 1st, it's the last day and the last opportunity you have to get that youth of yours signed up for 2018 Summer Fund with 4-H. Uh, last week, uh, Jada Hannah was here with us on the program, and she is the intern for Person County 4-H. And a lot of their summer classes are already full, but they still have some openings. For more information, call 336-599-1195. Speak with Michelle Van S. But if you want to get that youth of yours signed up for any of the 4-H classes, uh, the deadline is today, and you have to have your money paid by this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Here's some information from Our Pride Foods. Goodness grows in North Carolina. Our Pride Premium Pimento Cheese Spread and Dip is made in Roxboro. You can pick up some to enjoy at T.G. Brooks Company, Twins Market, Hurdle Mills Market and Butcher Shop, North Main IGA, Food Lion, Supply Line Discounts in South Boston, Virginia, Kenyon's Meat Market in Mebane, and Bacon's Meat Market in Hillsboro or you can enjoy it at Cole's Pharmacy, Trish's Espresso, and the Clarksville Station. Whether you're having Owl Pride Premium Pimento Cheese Spread and Dip for a snack or a meal, it's delicious. Owl Pride Premium Pimento Cheese Spread and Dip is made by Owl Pride Foods in Roxboro. Pick up some and enjoy it today. For extra flavor, try the jalapeno added. That's our pride, premium pimento cheese spread and dip. 
Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program. Gary Cross is our guest today. He is the uh, crop extraordinaire. Here we go. For a person in Granville Counties. And when, he's, when we talk <laughs> about crops, we talk about field crops, uh, corn, sorghum, tobacco, soybean, barley, wheat, the list just goes on. Uh, but before we talk to Gary a little bit more, I want to make mention of a few other things pertaining to the uh, North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. It's going to be a horse club interest meeting. Uh, and the question is, do you love horses? You do. Then Person County 4-H has a club for you. This meeting will be on June the 28th. I believe that will be a Thursday at 6 p.m. And it's to all Person County youth between the ages of 5 and 18 as of January 1st, 2018. The meeting will be at the Person County Office Building, 304 South Morgan Street. And if you do have a love for horses, and you're between the age of 5 and 18, why not consider attending this meeting? Uh, they ask that you RSVP, and you can call Michelle Van S at 336-599-1195, or if you're someone that prefers email, uh, Michelle's email is Michelle underscore Van S, and that's V-A-N-N-E-S-S, at ncsu.edu again michelle underscore vaness at ncsu.edu again that meeting will be on june 28th also uh in cooperation with um person county healthy personians and the uh cooperative extension service of person county they are going to be having a diabetes prevention program, and it will start on June 12th. And they will start meeting on Tuesday, June 12th, and they will have <clears throat> meetings that run through September, and then they will have meetings also in October and November. These meetings will take place in the county office building it's a cost of $25, and again, it's Diabetes Prevention Program. For more information, you can call 336-597-2204, extension 2277. Again, 336-597-2204, extension 2277. And one other thing, uh, Miss Jennifer Grable, who is the Family Consumer Science Agent for the Person in Granville County Cooperative Extension Service, along and in conjunction with Person County Public Library, they're going to be having a little uh, seminar and a little class, More Flavor, Less Salt. Learn about cooking with herbs. Jennifer Grable, the Family Consumer Science Extension Agent, will be teaching this at Person County Library Wednesday, June 13th at 4 o'clock. Person County Library is located 319 South Main Street. They will be talking about health benefits, herb and food combos, herb recipe ideas, and garnishes. For more information, 336-599-1195 and speak with Jennifer Grable. Anyway, Gary, um, good programs all. It really one is. One thing I, the only one thing on the less salt, I wish Carl Cantaloupe would send me some of those salty potato uh, chips. <laughs> you know, I haven't spoken with Carl in a while. I know he's busy. I need to call and check in on him. Uh, Gary, you have not been here uh, since the uh, uh, malt barley tour. Yep. And uh, that, that was back that. In, in, in April in Granville County. That went well. Um, uh, had a good, good turnout of participants. Uh, could have had a better turnout, but we had about 25, 30 at it. And uh, the 
main themes were about quality. I think this year, instead of raising it in production, we focus more on the, the end part of it. Uh, the mitotoxins, which get on the barley, which create problems in the malting process and the brewing process. We really got into that. We talked about some of the different varieties. We talked about fertility differences uh, in uh, uh, some of the varieties and, and creating a fertility standard uh, throughout the state with it. And uh, we got into talking about fungicides being used on malt barley, which is kind of a new issue and um, just basically uh, had a great cookout afterwards and uh, had a good program overall and basically focused on just quality issues. So a lot of people left with some good knowledge about you bet. malt barley. You bet. Uh, and you know, Gary, uh, you, you just mentioned fungicides. Uh, we've talked about it numerous times on the program. Uh, when you go to the supermarket, and you see these picture perfect apples, you know what? They just didn't show up at the grocery That's exactly store on right. their own. Uh, these people that have these uh, orchards for a livelihood, they actually, <clears throat> it's a, more or less a year round operation for them. You bet. And one thing you have to be diligent on spraying your fungicides and one thing that I, I just want to make mention of with all the rain that we have had you may need to step up on your spray regimen for fungicides because even though the fungicide dries on the actual you know uh, trees after so much rain, it right. kind of gets washed off. So just if, if, if you've been kind of saying, well, I'm going to spray, uh, and I'm just using this as an example, I'm going to spray fungicides uh, every other Tuesday. That may all be well, good, and fine, but from this Tuesday to the following Tuesday, if you've had, you know, two, three, maybe four inches of rain, all the fungicide that you applied on Tuesday is going to be long gone. gone before Tuesday in two weeks. I had a, I have a plot that um, I'm working on with USDA. Uh, it's it's not a Roundup plot, so I can't spray Roundup. You know, Roundup you can spray on just about any crop right. now, except for uh, the crop I'm working on. And uh, we sprayed. Um, I think it was last Friday before last. Um, not fungicide, but a herbicide, and you can't tell we sprayed it. It's yeah. washed it off. I mean, it's that bad out here. You, I mean, you're going to have to do a lot of repeating, whether it's ornamental, whether it's uh, field crop. There's just going to have to be some repeating uh, going on out here, and uh, we've had a lot of struggles with that. Um, you know, we were talking about emergence earlier. On we we also do this in soybeans, and I was telling you I did a the first day flagging of the soybean emergence and couldn't and have not been able to get back in to do the second and third so the, the plot's pretty much done so I'll probably come back and weed and do it with that double crop beans after wheat and um, you know we're also looking we I've had this will be my third year on this and we are seeing significant differences in first day soybeans that come up versus third day right. fourth day I mean it's it's again we're needing to focus again on that front end uh, of what we're doing out here in agriculture and um, that's where a lot of the issues are and uh, you know Carl Cantalupi you worked with him for 10 years in relation to spraying everything uh, and, he, and you know you don't get apples by uh, just letting it go and that's not right. putting anything on it you got to thin them you got to spray fungicides uh, you got to do all types of different issues to be able to get a quality apple yeah and, and, and it's pretty much that way with any type of fruit, vegetable, or crop. You've got to tend to it. And in the perfect world, plant it today, go back, you know, 60 to 80 days later and harvest. And um, another thing, pollination is a big, big factor in, uh, you know, gardening and, and, and in field crops. You know, bees are a wonderful pollinator, and if you are using 
a seven product, uh, a water soluble seven, it's not quite as harmful to bees as the seven That's does. That's exactly right. And and something else, um, with, with with all the rain fall that we have had, uh, if it turns off dry, you know, still keep a check on ground moisture levels because you may say, well, you know, we had three inches of rain last week. When it's hot and humid, it doesn't take a long for, you know, bare soil to dry, to, to, to dry out. So you need to kind of stay on top of it. But just want to let you know that if you have not uh, got your garden planted yet, if you're in need of vegetable garden plants, fertilizer, maybe who knows you're ready for one of those homemade ice cream freezers from T.G. Brooks Company. They can help you out with that. Landscaping supplies, well water pumps, hand cut ribeyes. I can, I, can I be frank with you? I wish you would buy a homemade ice cream maker and invite me in once a week. Why don't you do that, Rob Hall? Buy a, a homemade ice cream maker. Well, I got a better idea. Why don't you buy <laughs> a homemade ice cream maker? Freezer. freezer? And you can invite the radio station twice a week. <laughs> and a good at idea. the end of the summer, we can fill out a little survey and a little summary of which homemade ice cream you made for us that we enjoyed the best. That's good stuff. That's good it stuff. Is. Let's get a word on for T.G. Brooks Company. They're located 411 Helena Mariah Road, T.G. Brooks Company. They've been in business since 1936. You won't find a nicer group of people there. Bill, Roy, and all of their staff, they're there to assist you. And if you have a question about a particular product, they will be glad to help you get the answer that you need. If not, they won't snowball you and try to convince you that, you know, it's something that uh, you, you need when you may not need it. But they're just good people there at T.G. Brooks Company in Timberlake. What a terrific spring we had. T.G. Brooks says now it's June and July and the months when we start to see the fruits of our spring labor in our yards and our gardens. The planting season has been a good one and you still have time to plant some vegetables and flowers. When the gardens come in, they have your canning jars and half pints, pints, quarts, half gallons, plus pressure cookers, pressure canners, bath canners, strainers, funnels, and most other canning supplies. It's also wide open lawn and garden time. T.G. Brooks has plenty of tomato plants still. They have lots of them, several varieties, and they still have some vegetable plants and garden seed. They have irrigation supplies and water hose and nozzles and sprinklers and all that you need during these drier weeks, we'll see. Reseed your lawn with clean, fresh seed, and they have fertilizer and, of course, lime. They have sprayers, both tank and backpack, and if you need mulch, they have it, even the triple ground mulch. T.G. Brooks has your insecticides for vegetables and fungicides, they have chemicals for your grass protection and bug protections, too, for home pest control. In fact, all your garden and home chemical needs are at one spot. No matter if you are the homeowner or a commercial landscaper, T.G. Brooks Company handles everybody with the same service. They can arrange delivery, or you can pull up with your pickup truck, trailer, and they'll load it up for you. They have bag products they'll load up for you in your car or van. When the day is done, nothing tops it off like a hand-cut ribeye steak cooked to your desired level on your grill. So make way on over to 411 Helena Mariah Road in Timberlake. 364-2428 is their number. And as always, T.G. Brooks Company proudly has served the homeowner, the farmer, and those in construction since way back in 1936. And they welcome folks from all over Person County in Rougemont, Northern Durham, and of course, Southern Person County. Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program, and uh, Gary Cross is the crop agent for Person in Granville Counties. Gary, uh, how long have you uh, been on the uh, 
the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. Team. Four years. Four years. Well, now, of, of, of your four years here, just kind of looking back on it uh, weather-wise, uh, do you remember that we have had as wet of a spring as we're having right now? Last year uh, was a little earlier uh, on the weather, uh, not as much rain. I, but I don't know, this is the most rain I think I've experienced since I've been here early uh, in this time frame. Um, you know, of course, I've been through, you know, whole fall and summer droughts already in four years, but uh, this is the most rain I've seen. You know, over to Oxford region, I mean, it's varied on rain out here. But we've had over 10 inches of rain over there. And, uh, and I know, Rob, that uh, some of your counterparts out in the west end of the state uh, I guess they've experienced 10, 12 inches or having mudslides and all types of things out there. I heard in some parts of uh, the mountains in North Carolina, they've had 20 inches of rain. And How do you keep a house on the side of a hill? You don't, I guess. That's a terrible thing. It really is. And, and um, you know, it's been a lot of folks that's, you know, had flooding issues. And uh, we will say one thing, uh, if you or ever out and about driving and you come across come across pond or standing water in the uh, highway uh, think of this turn around don't drown right you know in many cases people say well I think I can make it through there and a lot of people has put themselves in jeopardy you know attempting that but um, you know, Mother Nature, uh, she's going to uh, bring the weather in and take care of the things the way that she feels it needs to be. And I guess it's a really good thing that the weather is in, uh, in, in the hands of the good Lord and Mother Nature because if mankind controlled it, we would probably be the biggest war of anything, wouldn't it, Gary? Oh, I'm sure it would. I need to ask you a question. You have horses. You've been around animals all your life. I've been out in the fields, but I'm next to a lot of pastures that have horses and cows in it. The flies, I've never seen the flies this bad. Flies have you, have are you had really problems? bad. We, well, we always have, you know, flies. Whenever you've got livestock around, you've got flies. And it, it, it is it's really tough. And, I mean, it's like you can... Are you, you spraying know, them? Or? You, you can spray. And, Lord, have mercy, you know, it's... It, it's these sprays only recommend that you spray every so often, depending on the brands. But it's like, you know, you spray it a day and you go back two days later and they are just uh, covered in flies. And one thing that... Um, I've, I've never seen them this bad. Uh, you know, just flies are, are, are really bad. And, and I'm not talking a small fly. I'm yeah. talking one that's... You oh, know, yeah, size larger of flies, yeah. And one thing that, um, that 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 I want to fix is a horse fly trap. And uh, Paul Westfall uh, had made mention to me about a horse fly trap, and it's some people down in Granville County that has a horse fly trap. And I happen to know the lady, and and uh, you know everybody in Granville uh, County. I've decided Paul actually. Uh, kind of gave me a blueprint of it, and I was looking at it a little bit last night. But uh, I actually called the people that have the uh, horse fly trap, and they actually have, I think, about four on their farm. And uh, she said, Rob, you're welcome to come and look at it anytime. And she said, It works really well. And uh, can you explain it? Can well, from is it what something they walk through, or no, from, from, from what I gather. It's just a, a, a board up, and it has black plastic on it, and, and, and that black plastic actually attracts a horse fly because they think it's a cow. But when they fly into the plastic, they kind of crawl the way down to the bottom, and then they get in this trough that has water in it, and it's like a piece of plexiglass that's over the trough. Once they go in, they cannot come out. 
and they drowned in this water. And I've heard some people say you can use regular water. Or some people put uh, soap sudsy water in it. But if you go to YouTube and you Google horsefly traps, several different ones come up. And I have asked several people about horsefly traps. And um, from what they have experienced, and we have experienced this in a sense, you know, when, when, when we feed the horses, you know, we'll stand there and we'll pop horse flies, but it seems like it can be 10 horse flies there, and you may kill eight of them, and Lord have mercy, there's 10 more than showed up to take the place of the eight that you have killed. And I so, know I know there's some people like Johnny Coley has cows, our horticulture agent, and this is more livestock. Um, but I, you know, I can't get over noticing this. I mean, if I'm noticing it out here when I'm looking at a crop issue, and then I just turn my head and look and see all the flies on these animals. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, it's not anything the owner's doing wrong. He's not doing anything wrong. They're just that thick yeah. this year. Yeah. And. Uh, w w with the moisture and things, and, and I'd also have, have thought about making mention of uh, mosquitoes. Now, the best way to avoid mosquitoes is do not have a breeding ground for them. Anytime that it is standing water, that is breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And when I say standing water, it can be standing water in a mud hole, and it can be standing water in a soft drink can. It can be standing water in an old tire that may, may be That's laying out somewhere. And if you have uh, bird baths, uh, it's a good idea to change the water in the bird baths every couple of days. Now, if you have automatic waterers, for your livestock you don't have to worry about that too much because the livestock is drinking the water and, and the water is being you know rotated but if it's water standing in a spot and it's just sitting there you know that's breeding grounds for you know mosquitoes so it's a lot of little things you can do also it's a good idea uh, you know with so many diseases now that are being spread by mosquitoes and Horses, even more really. so uh, ticks. If you're planning to be outside, it's a good idea to uh, find you some type of insect repellent with the DEET, but always read the instructions. And if you have small children, uh, I think it's uh, a limit on the amount of percentage of DEET that you know can be used on children so if you ever purchase any bug spray read the directions because uh, you know you want it to be effective and also with all this being said if you're out working in the uh, yard or at the pool uh, wear some sunscreen now I always wear a hat during the year and uh, I, I should use uh, sunscreen, but I don't. You you need a real cowboy hat. Yeah. I, I think that's your hat setting here. Well, but, that's uh, one I wear when it's raining and stuff, and typically I have like a, a straw hat that I wear during the spring and summer. You have horses, you need a cowboy hat. But, There's uh, just no doubt about it. But anyway, just, you know, if you're going to the lake, if you're going to the pool, you know, after you go in for a little dip, it's a good idea to uh, to to apply, you know, uh, suntan uh, oils and lotions because you know uh, a sunburn can be very painful and it could turn into sun poison, and that's something that you want to avoid if at all possible. You know, one of our sponsors here. On the Gardener's Corner program is Sandling Golf Cars. Sandling Golf Cars is located 613 Lewis Street in Oxford. They offer service after the sale. If you're ever in need of golf car repairs, 
They have Trojan batteries. Uh, maybe you're having problems with your golf car charger. Sandling golf cars in many cases can repair golf car chargers. Wilmington grills, trailers, and more. Let's take a trip to Oxford. Need of a flatbed for that truck? Sandling golf cars and trailers located 613 Lewis Street in Oxford now has flatbeds for trucks available. They are open weekdays 8 until 5.30, Saturdays 9 until 1. Call 1-800-221-9267 or you can call Sandling Golf Cars and Trailers locally at 919-693-4626. You'll also find the full line of Wilmington Grills. They have a large selection of golf cars, club car, easy go, and Yamaha golf cars available, new and pre-owned. If you're in need of Trojan batteries, parts, or service, shop at Sandling Golf Cars and Trailers, 613 Lewis Street in Oxford. Speaking of trailers, you'll find trailers of all kinds at Sandling Golf Cars. Call 919-693-4626 or toll-free 1-800-221-9267. That's Sandling Golf Cars and Trailers. All righty, here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program. Gary Cross is our uh, guest today. He is the crop agent for Person in Granville County's Cooperative Extension Service offices. Uh, Gary, uh, now... Maybe some soybeans have been planted, but Not a lot of the farmers have been concentrating on getting corn planted and tobacco, and then it will be soybeans. Now, as, as far as soybeans go, uh, I guess the term Roundup Ready soybeans came out several years ago. And I remember seeing a program on PBS one night, and uh, they take this Roundup Ready soybean business extremely serious. And uh, I believe the company Monsanto has a team of investigators that were uh, investigating farmers that have purchased Roundup ready soybeans. Now they were cleaning and tra and keeping the seed, which you're not allowed to do. To, to, to replant every right. year. Right. You can't do that. So it's patented product, and patented products you can't redo. If you patent a Chevrolet car exactly the way it is, uh, you will get you're in violation of the federal patent laws. And so uh, they can come down pretty serious on farmers yeah, and have that. Yeah. Now. Uh, as far as, and, and I guess, you know, the trade name or the store name is Roundup, but it's gloss, Glossophate. Is glossophate. that how you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, Glossophate, yeah. Now, <clears throat> do, do you foresee them coming out with a lot of other crops that have been genetically engineered, you know, to where they can be sprayed with glossoph Glossophate to keep? Uh, you know, weed growth down. Um, that that that's kind of a that's a tough question. Just from the standpoint of uh, we're getting so much glyphosate resistance because people found it to be cheap, and uh, you know, clean the whole field up with one or two sprays at the most. Which also, which people do not realize out here, is extraordinarily environmental friendly. Uh, for years, we were using chemicals that leached into the soil, stayed there, carried over. Roundup, you don't have that problem. So farmers, you know, were being good stewards, but they also, economically, they were using so much of it, Rob, they got resistance to it. Uh, I see some chemicals being, uh, some uh, genetics being done with chemicals. Of course, we've had some struggles with the uh, dicamba products and soybeans, even though they effectively work well. There's some other products coming up here, but one of the biggest issues we're having in resistance and crops is insect. Uh, North Carolina has one of the, I, I planted a plot, the one I was telling you earlier that's being drowned, uh, but in that plot, uh, the resistant corn to the insect 
uh, will get as much worm damage as the non-resistant damage because really? we have not done uh, we could have done a better job in planting probably uh, what we call refuge corn uh, across uh, the state and this is a problem all across uh, the south because their requirement is larger because we have a 20 percent has to be refuge corn and not insect resistant corn and then in Illinois and in, in, in Iowa it's five percent so um, and there's a lot of discussion a lot of between entomologists and researchers and companies on you know are we what direction are we going in the thing about why people didn't plant a lot of refuge corn uh, has been a problem systematic to anything they weren't getting the yield with the refuge corn it could be anywhere as as far as 10 bushel less which at four dollar corn is real money that's right and that's the reason why you know they would plant you know 10 percent or five percent or or however because farmers when they plant refuge would not make as much money off of that corn as they would off the insect resistant corn so you've got a kind of double-edged sword of EPA wanting this and then uh, you know the farmer saying well you know I got to do what makes money for me that's right. so and that's that's where we're at on on a lot of issues out here in agriculture period well you know Gary we, we've talked about it before and I made mention within the last couple of weeks about <clears throat> the, the way that the world is shaped up with the population and the versus the number of farmers I think it's somewhere about a hundred and fifty five people that each farmer is feeding yeah that's, that's and sounds right we're very fortunate that you know farmers are making their operations as efficient as possible because you know when a farmer can uh, produce and not have to have sky high prices for that product you know that helps us the consumer right. save money wouldn't you agree i would agree and uh, uh one thing i'd like to mention before we uh, get off here rob is we, we were trying to pass a 2018 farm bill which takes care of a lot of different issues um, it failed uh, a couple of fridays ago not to pass because of two or three different issues uh, we got to pass that because every time we do an extension of like the 2014 farm bill we do them every four years it costs taxpayers a lot more money to do those extensions than it does to put an efficient new farm bill in but we've had some um, issues in the 2018 farm bill that dealt with immigration and the snap program and others that they couldn't get together on uh, agreeing to get it passed so they're going to go back to the table and try and get it but it is essential to get that passed one thing that is in the farm bill that a lot of people do not realize is that it's introduced by senator mcconnell out of kentucky and being supported uh, by senators here is the new hemp act and the new hemp act is um, trying to take all these issues that we're dealing with with industrial hemp and trying to get them kind of washed out to be able for farmers to produce it a senator out of oregon says i can go in any store and buy it as a supplement or whatever and but my farmers in Oregon can't produce it we have to buy it from China or some other country because we can't produce it here well this act is going to take some of the uh, noise I, I guess is the best way out of it and this will be stuff that will be able to be produced under the uh, guidelines of uh, under 0.3 percent in relation to the uh, chemical in it that if it gets above that then that